and we are live. How you doing, Lloyd? Pretty good, man. How are you doing? Good, good, dude. Um, appreciate you coming on and mm -hmm. can't wait to talk with you more about um, how things have been going the last couple of years. For sure. Absolutely. I, um, I, you know, when you first asked me to do this, I was slightly nervous just because one, I haven't done a lot of podcast. Actually, I, I, I've never done a podcast. Um, but as I started to really think about um, kind of what you're trying to do here mm -hmm. um, and kind of have a conversation and, and reflect on your work and your, you know, all that kind of stuff, it, it really forces you to think about your life and how you've gotten to a certain point. And I really appreciate that. So. Yeah, man. Thank you for saying that. Um, can you see me and hear me? Okay. Um, it's given me a chance to reflect and kind of think and get excited for a good conversation. For sure, man. Um, yeah, that's the thing. It's like people say, well, okay, you're interested in motivation and, you know, work ethic and these kinds of things, but why are you recording it? And the answer is, I don't, I don't really know. I don't exactly understand yet, but I know that like mm -hmm. every day I'm curious about what makes people in my life kind of tick and, and go and keep going. Absolutely. Um, and ever, I think everyone has gifts and everyone has a different perspective that I can learn something from. So mm -hmm. whether it's, I, I don't think I'm ever going to monetize this thing. It's, it's not about that. It's just like mm -hmm. my personal search for truth. And if it's just me watching it when I'm 85 years old on my deathbed, then <laughs> yeah, it will it serve its purpose, you know? So for sure. Cool, man. Um, so you and I got drinks probably what, four or five weeks ago here yeah. in West Group. Mm -hmm. Really enjoyed catching up with you and just, you know, going back the last couple of years. I know we spent some time together in Cathedral and then at IU and, mm -hmm. um, you know, here you are in Chicago living in over there in Oak Park. Are you still liking it? I, I love Oak Park. Um, have you spent much time out, out in this area? Or I think I told you, yeah. So I learned tennis at this place called Tennis and Fitness Club. Yep. And it's like a small kind of like old school mm -hmm. gym. Not much to write home about. But yeah. because I was there once a week over COVID, it was a way to, you know, do something athletic mm -hmm. while not while being able to socially distance during COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, I spent time in Oak Park downtown going to Chipotle after it. Or mm -hmm. before tennis, I went to the Frank Lloyd Wright home that's just down the street. Oh, yeah from that place and yeah. it's a really cool town I think because it's 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 not the suburbs it's not the city it's kind of like perfectly in the middle mm -hmm. or close to everything but I guess I'm talking yeah, I mean I know people. you're I, would you say I'm sorry <laughs> I said I, I'm the one now talking about it you you're the one that lives yeah. there, so tell me about no, it. I know you're I know you're into um like architecture um yeah, and and you know the fact that there's some you know there's Frank Lloyd Wright house not in my backyard but you know when I ride into Oak Park downtown Oak Park go to the gym um, do a lot of my shopping. I'm, I'm riding right past Frank Lloyd Wright homes and a lot of beautiful architecture. Um, the neighborhoods back there are stunning. Um, and I love it. So, yeah, before I went to, uh, one specific tennis lesson, I went to the Frank Lloyd Wright home and I was going through a really tough time in my life. And mm -hmm. I just sat on the grass there in front of it. Maybe it was like not allowed, but there's no fence or anything. And I just looked, I looked at it and I was like, just tried to understand the angles of the roof to how he's able oh, to yeah. create, like, you know, con structure and cohesion with, with vertical and horizontal lines. Mm -hmm. And I almost got emotional, man, because like, I <laughs> love that cool, stuff yeah. uh -huh. so much. And it's art. Architecture is art. And when you're in a moment of like searching or a really tough emotional time, mm -hmm. art kind of does ground you and it brings you back to this timeless element of, um, of connection, right? Like here I oh, am. Yeah. He's, I love Frank Lloyd Wright. This is mm -hmm. his home that he he lived in and yeah. he built. Like it's it's incredible. So I was really thankful for that, and it was That's a really very cool. cool. Yeah, no, it's yeah. His homes are beautiful, and and I totally get that connection uh, through art. Um, I've you know I've done a lot of art in my life, and as well as music. And mm -hmm. I think I think art and music um, are one of the one of the few ways that people find common ground and connect. Um, in ways, you know, in ways that are kind of unexplainable. So yeah, yeah. I agree with you for, for sure. Yeah. I remember back at Cathedral, you were doing a lot of drawing and art. Mm -hmm. And uh, do, you, do you still do some of that on your free time or not so much? Um, you know, honestly, I haven't as much recently. Um, I, I, I do occasionally. I would say I, I I probably play guitar more often than I do than I do drawing. Um, yeah. I do 
I am supposed to do, I've challenged myself to do a, a watercolor piece in the next couple months. So um, I'm forcing myself to, to go back into it and do it a little bit more than I have been. So, yeah, man. One of, what I wanted to talk to you about was a couple things, but one of the most important mm -hmm. things I think is like your journey. Um, someone mm -hmm. who's artistic, someone who is a musician, you know, uh, you and I have connected on music really heavily, like where I feel like I can, I, I know exactly what you're thinking. Even yeah. just, you talked about, the, remember the song was called uh, Call Me Maybe? Oh, yes. Of you're course, like, yeah. really, the song sucks, but you, do you know why it's so damn <laughs> like repeatable and why it's so addicting? It's because it's like one, two, three, four. And then she skips. She's like, here's my number. So call me maybe. And it's like, mm -hmm. you knew the the music theory behind what makes a song catchy, right? And yeah, I absolutely remember that about you. So that was cool. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I would not consider myself an expert in that by any means, but I do Taylor, you know, Taylor, my fiance and I were talking about this the other night. It's like, I, you know, some people hear words in music. Um, when I hear a song, I, I think of the melody and what, what is catchy about the melody and what um, kind of draws you in from the musical side of it more so than the words. Yeah. Like in the hook, it's like, and this is crazy, but like, mm -hmm if you're on the normal tempo of the song, it'd be, this is crazy, but she goes, and this is crazy. Like she, yep. she holds it for like Just one that little hold. second. Exactly. And if you think about like guitar or harmonica or anything that's spoken word, any sort of art, when, when a musician holds it for that, just like mm -hmm. a millisecond, it shows yep. that they're, they're almost like in command of the craft, you know? Oh, for sure. I mean, it, oh my God. Yeah. I don't know. You know, this may not be your style of music, but, um, you know, part of what makes one Willie Nelson so difficult to learn how to play and two, so attractive to a lot of people is that he play his style of playing and the notes that he hits on his guitar are way off of the beat. Um, and so it's, it's one difficult to play and two, it's, it's, it's unique and different. Um, and it kind of challenges people's ear. And I think it's those things in music that are, that challenge your ear a little bit, something that you're not used to, that you're not expecting, um, that really are what draw you in. Least, yeah. You know, from my perspective. So if I had to explain what makes music so amazing is that it's just the consistent, repeatable pattern, right? But when they do, mm -hmm. when the musician that's an expert throws in that extra bit of unpredictability, it's mm -hmm. like our brains and our hearts crave that little mm -hmm. bit of, of personal touch. Yeah. I know what you mean. Like when I think of a guitar solo, like John Mayer or Eric Clapton, like the reason a solo is so impactful in music is because that's their, it, it, it goes away from the, the beat and it, it's just the mm -hmm. styling for just a second. Even if yeah. it's, oh, yeah. every single time they perform that solo, um, there's maybe something a little different about how they mm -hmm. play that note or, you know, so man, I, I know what you're, I know that you get what I'm saying right now. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it conveys a lot of the emotion and, um, and that's unique to that. Yeah. To that. It's really cool. So, yeah. So I, I don't want to talk too much about like cathedral, but you know, went mm -hmm. to IU together. You skipped a year after uh, IU before you, or before you went to IU. Mm -hmm. And I remember like, I went straight to Chicago. I believe you might've went to Indy for a year before Nashville. Was that true? Uh, no. Well, so I was in Indianapolis for a summer, uh -huh. pretty much the summer after we graduated. And I moved to Nashville that September, I think, after okay. we graduated. Yeah. Yeah. So not too much long after. And I imagine what drew you to Nashville might have been the music scene or were you trying to, quote unquote, make it in music? Uh, what was that um, like? Yeah, I mean, it was, for me, it was old. Uh, music was definitely the reason I chose Nashville. Um, I think when I was in college, I always wanted to leave Indiana. And ex even if I came back to Indiana one day, I wanted to experience something different. Um, and Nashville was where I landed for a couple of reasons. One, I had some friends who were living there, already kind of tapped into the music industry. Um, and, and Nashville was kind of booming uh, in the music, as far as the music industry was concerned. Uh, I was also considering LA, which was a lot more expensive and I didn't know anybody. Um, so it had been a lot difficult to. Um, and it turned out Nashville was a great place because I wanted to try and do songwriting. Um, and Nashville is kind of known for being a hub for songwriters. And 
there were all places around town where you could get up on stage and with other singer songwriters and swap songs and um you know kind of expose yourself that way so that you know that was kind of I, I visited Nashville you know and kind of got that experience um and that's you know kind of why I decided to move there yeah when we got drinks you said that um you didn't realize just the level of talent even though oh, yeah. songwriting or you said mm -hmm. that after you get off your shifts or whatever you would go to see these people and just you know kind of be in a circle playing music together and you're like like everyone in nashville if they're a server oh, yeah. or a valet parker like, oh yeah they are incredible musicians <laughs> for sure that was certainly my experience it was humbling um everyone i felt like was better than me and and it was that's the environment you want to be in though right i mean you don't want to you don't want to walk in somewhere being the best um i i learned a lot from that experience so yeah when you would join those circles would you play guitar every time or would you switch up instruments or would you just kind of sit and listen how did you um i would play guitar a lot of the times um i don't know if you've ever heard of an instrument called a cajon no um, um but it's basically it's like a wooden box um that's structured to almost work like a drum set depending on where you hear hit it so you can get different tones um so it's great to sit on that and play guitar for your song and then you could play play that as almost like a percussion instrument to back up some of the other your songwriters if you knew them and they wanted you to play along with uh, their music so mm -hmm. and you said that you were i know that you're doing kind of like the nine to five corporate thing for a little mm -hmm. bit i did that out of school and i hated sitting at a cubicle um mm -hmm. so props to you for doing it longer than that even I, i'm in sales <laughs> now but i get the chance to visit customers and work from home and everything yeah um, but I know you you did some bartending for uh, oh, yeah. for a little bit, and I saw an amazing quote by Bourdain recently, mm -hmm. RIP, and he's talking about how the service industry, like especially like restaurants, you learn more in that setting about multitasking, about you know taking in information at once, how to work with pressure, but most of all, you learn about people. Oh yeah, uh, he's like no no offense to my professors, but. I've learned more in one year working at a restaurant than any sort of college experience on any campus I've ever been at, right? And I think that was so important. And you talked about those Sunday brunches where you're just like in the weeds, right? There's oh, yeah. 15 drink tickets in front of you and everyone wants their drink faster nah. than yeah. a second ago, right? <laughs> yeah. um, and so just being able to multitask and people at the bar that ask me, hey, one more piece of ice in this drink. <laughs> mm -hmm. So tell me more about that experience and what it was like learning how to bartend oh yeah i would um my last year in nashville i was working bar you know as a bartender uh, in a place called settler saloon um and i would i would say for me that was one of the more transformative years of my life and partially mainly because of that experience that i had in the service industry um, a lot to do with the people that i met um the people that I worked with were great people. I made great relationships. Um, and I would second that quote, you know, what you, what you said, uh, you know, Bourdain said, I learned more from working in the service industry, I think, uh, about work ethic, um, about, you know, you know, if you were wanting or willing to work when others were not, um, you could make money. I mean, like, more money the more I mean the more hours you worked the more shifts you picked up the more money you made and so it kind of teaches you the value of your time um and that like how you can turn your time and your effort um and then you know again working in a high pressure situation when when you've got like you said 15 20 drink tickets um half of them are three or four step cocktails that you just learned how to make you know <laughs> two days before <laughs> you know so it's but it's fun like you know you build a you kind of go into the weeds with with your co-workers you you kind of go into the you know into the shit for a couple hours you all make good money and you work hard and you get good tips and um and it sucks for a little bit but then you you kind of all go through that and it builds it builds a really strong team Totally. Um, as long as everyone pulls their weight, um, and you know, it's at least that was my experience. So, yeah, and there's a couple of things about that I didn't even think about. I mean, just this idea of willing to work when others aren't, 
Well, mm -hmm. I, I, I was a server in Indianapolis for six or seven months before I found my, my a company that I did like called Geophedia. Um, and I remember thinking, oh, I'm just so tired of working nights and weekends. But that was a really important time because I fucking understood in that moment that mm -hmm. people do that for their, like, pe people don't have that choice. Like, I'm so thankful yeah. to do what I do now. And um, not just, it's not about like me and my gratitude. It's just like, there's so much that you learn about handling pressure and just even like mm -hmm. the, the grimy, literally the grimy nature of working in a kitchen. Oh yeah. Like you're shoveling shit. Like you're literally like taking mm -hmm. people's old food and throwing in the trash. Like you're doing dishes. Like And you deal with rude dishes. people and like, and, and you deal with drunk yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. You know, so yeah. And people are, some people are just thankless too, you know, like they really are. Yeah. The ability to put a smile on and just like, it's mind over matter. It's not about me and my ego, just fucking smile. Hey, it sounds mm -hmm. good guy. And then at the end of the shift, hey, that guy was a dickhead, you know, but <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, that's an important skill too, to not, not react all the time. So mm -hmm. there's just so much I can go into on that, but I yeah. would also say for, for me too, um, I mean, you've always been, as long as I've known you, um, you've been a very personable, like outgoing uh, person. Um, and, and I don't know if that yeah, it comes naturally or if you feel like that comes naturally to you. Um, I certainly felt like, you know, for a long time, I was very shy and reserved. And it was jobs like serving, um, bartending, um, playing music, you know, and being forced to go out in front of people um, and interact with people uh, in stressful or, you know, situations putting myself in a situation I hadn't been in before um it kind of forced me to be personable when I didn't want to be sometimes it forced me to learn skills um I wouldn't call myself a salesperson because I don't think I am necessarily but it certainly gave me a skill set I feel like um in inner and in dealing with people um, yeah I mean it, if you think that I have those skills it's, it's a direct result of just working at it I mean I've, I've always been someone that likes people but you know, mm -hmm. in high school, I was a little rough around the edges, you know, <laughs> I've had to learn how to like kind of uh, hone in my fire, if that makes sense. But no, it does. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that there's if there's one thing I've gotten out of what's it, 25 of these podcasts. It's like it's it's cheesy, but it's the journey, not the destination. Like this idea mm -hmm. of working on things that are hard consistently. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the first person on a podcast to talk about that. Right. Like Joe, Joe Rogan yeah. or, you know, Tim Ferriss, whoever it is, that's like what they talk about is how to be a how to do personal development um but yeah whether it's when you're literally freestyling music and people are listening mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's the real shit man like <laughs> if, if someone is on stage doing a comedy show and yeah. people are paying for that ticket to oh, laugh yeah. and, and you're you're not killing you're doing the opposite you're you know oh, yeah. people, speaking tough. of comedy i uh, there was one time i i did a i was doing a writer's round and i got up there and i tried to make a a joke um about pluto and like it was the worst joke I probably could have told. And it, you know, I looked out on out and everyone was just kind of silent looking at me like, and then yeah. I played a song and everyone loved the song and I felt, you know, after that, but it was anyway, just a fun, funny moment of really put yourself out there and fall completely, completely flat. So. And if you fall on your face, like what the worst that can happen, you know, people do, but then you go to bed that night. I love this too. No one ever goes to bed at night saying that person in my life or that person I don't even know thinking about that. Oh, they really fucked up. Like, <laughs> right. Just think about the, just the ridiculous nature of someone putting their mm -hmm. head on the pillow and being like, Ooh, Lloyd really bombed that joke. Yeah. Like, that that no Pluto joke, that. man. <laughs> People are just focused on themselves, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so besides the whole Nashville thing, I wanted to talk more about what you do now. Like, and mm -hmm. it, it takes us like a vulnerable ego to talk about being in the restaurant industry. I, I try to yeah. talk about it, but there was a point in my life where I was kind of shameful of that. Now you're someone that is literally a manager of a team. You work in finance, like almost the opposite of, uh, of working in a restaurant, you know, um, in terms of how people look at the, the those kinds of work. Um, what uh, well, I don't, yeah, I don't. Oh, sorry. You froze there for a second. And I don't know if that was my no. internet or your, sorry about that. It's all good, dude. I think you said, you, so you don't manage a team yet, but you want to, is that it? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly one of my goals. Um, and it's certainly um, something that I've expressed to my bosses. Um, and it, yes, yes. I think it is, it's a skill, it's a skill set that 
think I would be good at. Um, anyway, yeah. Yeah. What I was going to ask you about is um, kind of after Nashville, going to Indy and then go, coming up here to Chicago, I think you said that you and you moved with Taylor to Oak Park for her job, but tell mm -hmm. me more about, call it your, your white collar existence yeah. the last couple of years and how you've gotten to where you are now. Um, well, I mean, yeah, so we were talking about Nashville earlier um, and, and you referenced the nine to five job that I was working and the job that I have now to some degree bridges off of that job. Um, I'm in, you know, it's the same industry I work, you know, that job was a, a TPA that administered self-funded health insurance plans. Um, and I was working primarily in the IT department uh, doing coding, um, doing uh, plan uh, implementation, uh, kind of working with their claim system and whatnot. Um, and so now I work for a small MGU company that does underwriting for medical reinsurance. Um, and pretty much we, un I mean, you know what underwriting is. So we're, we're pricing group health plans that are self-funding Okay. Uh, we're pricing their stop loss insurance, um, which is they buy, they fund, say, claims for their employees up to, say, $30,000 for each employee. Um, and then we'll kick in after that uh, and pay anything above that, you know, that deductible level. Um, and so that job has led me to pursue actuary, um, actuary examinations. Um, to hopefully take me to the next step in that industry. Um, anyway, so yeah, I am preparing. I have another exam on the 13th of August. So that's a financial mathematics exam that I'm studying for. Yeah. So it's in terms of actuary, it, isn't that kind of like you're taking risk and then you're trying to put a formula behind it to understand how much you can bear or things? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it not to put it in too simplistic of terms, but it's effectively you know, your insurance rate, all the insurance rates, life, be it life insurance, car insurance, health insurance, um, regardless, is all based on actuarial tables that are, are put together by people who are looking at millions of lines of claims data across the country um, and using statistical probability models um, to pretty much, it sounds kind of morbid, but pretty much put a a price on your head of how much you know you're going to accrue you're expected to accrue in healthcare costs based on your age your you know a variety of different factors so. yeah I, I remember i worked at a company that gave us an app and they they, they offered benefits if you would track mm -hmm. your steps right and it was, oh, yeah. I think it was mm -hmm. the way that the insurance company gave them a, a deal if so many people signed up for this thing and what it was is we were they were selling our data <laughs> you know <laughs> but it's oh, also really? like well, I think it was yeah. not, it wasn't that, that bad, but it was more of the situation where it, it to them, it was like, we're going to encourage you to have a healthy lifestyle, mm -hmm. but the more they knew about us as workers, I'm sure there's some sort of a, a equation there on if people okay. are active, right. Mm -hmm. They're, they're probably less likely to, to yeah. get hurt or die or have a specific morbid disease, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. um, there's a reason they were doing that. I don't exactly quite know, but I, I have a hunch. Yeah. I mean, you do certainly, you bring up an interesting point, not to completely go off on a tangent, but, um, you know, you do teeter a fine line of um, how much of private information is, you know, acceptable <laughs> to expose to, you know, to do, um, to price insurance, mm -hmm. um, you know, anyway, just as a yeah. sidebar. So when it comes to the financial or the mathematical exams, what kinds of math is it? Um, so pretty much the first exam that I took was probability theory, um, which I had to go, I mean, it'd been 10 years since I graduated college um, when I started looking into this. Um, and maybe, yeah, 10, no, it's 10 years, 10 years now. So maybe, yeah, it was a couple of years ago. Um, and I had to reteach myself calculus. So I had to relearn how to do integrals, um, derivatives, double integrals, um, and it took it took a little while <laughs> to get there because I, you know, I hadn't done that stuff in a long time. But 
once I started diving back into it, I, I really realized that one, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and because I enjoyed it a lot, I actually could be good at it. Um, something that I didn't think of myself as really that good at when I was in high school uh, or even college. I mean, I took calculus in college and I did decently well, but you know, I never, never thought of myself as somebody who was a mathematician, right? Um, but I've, I've really, you know, I kind of, during COVID, when we were all kind of, we went from a working in the office environment to a purely working from home environment, a lot of places were shut down. I use it as an opportunity to really um, dive into learning calculus and probability theory to take that exam um, to see if it was something that I could, I could pass. Um, and, you know, I didn't pass the first time they have a 40, 30 to 40% pass rate. Um, so wow. I have, yeah, I've learned from a lot of people who have taken these examinations that you kind of have to get used to failing <laughs> to some yeah. degree because they're that difficult. Um, they make them hard on purpose, you know? Not very hard. Um, it's it's as much about purpose. perseverance as it is about intelligence. Um, you gotta, you know, you, you, you have to really want it because um, it is difficult. Um, but I get, you know, I get a rush when I solve a problem, when I get a problem yeah. right. It's, it's exhilarating. So. I've always been someone who's more humanities, English language versus math and science. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I do like about math, for instance, I work in business accounting, right? Mm -hmm. There is a right answer. <laughs> there Absolutely. is a right answer. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wrong answers. But when you find the right one, it's almost like catching the golden snitch. Yeah. It, it, for it's sure it is of truth and you're like i found yeah. the truth of the situation so i know i i think yeah. i understand that that it's trying to grasp that mm -hmm. um but especially you said like double derivatives or something oh you yeah, double <laughs> integrals and double There's yeah, yeah, layers yeah. to this shit that i'm you know it's like yeah and if you think about the world i've heard before the world is math like if you think about science it's all mathematical mm -hmm. based like i think fractals are really interesting oh, I yeah. think like the fibonacci sequence looking at, at nature or plants or it exists all over the place. And there mm -hmm. are some things about math that really pique my interest, but I know what you mean about, um, you know, it, it's, it's a, a craft. And what I, what it I is. heard you there is that back at cathedral, you know, Mrs. Ford's class, it's almost like you're being forced to do someone else's mm -hmm. thing. Right. But right. when you make it your own, I'm going to do this for me sitting mm -hmm. in COVID. I'm going to create something from my, from this, from this boredom. Right it almost, you create something totally new and unique yeah. yourself in that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm hearing is now that you made it your own and you have a goal behind it, it's not just sitting in class bored, twiddling yeah. your thumbs or <laughs> making jokes, right? Oh, it's, for sure. It's, and it's for me, real. it was like, it's as much about a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. Like, I can't tell you I mean, you probably feel this way about when you make a big sale, right? Like yeah. you, you're, you work really hard. And when you get across that finish line, um, when I passed that first exam, it was, it was, it felt so good. And I felt so accomplished. Um, and I passed many exams in my life, um, that didn't feel like that, you know? Um, and so, yeah, it's like setting a challenge for yourself and then seeing it through. That was, um, the, the most rewarding yeah i know what you mean like, there has gotten, been the most rewarding so. i've gotten commission checks that are amazing i'm just like oh my god mm -hmm. like, if and i thought of won the lottery or had some situation where i just got a lump sum of money it wouldn't mm -hmm. it wouldn't feel the same as the fact that i woke up every day for the last 18 months and i was like what's it going to take to get dominoes closer to the finish line and yep. when i got when i when i won the deal it's not even about the money or the check it's more just like that's the extrinsic reward for the intrinsic work of, of sitting there and doing it, mm -hmm. you know? Oh yeah. Um, and it, it made it so, so much more sweet when I was, I knew I was working my butt off <laughs> to yeah. get the thing done for and, sure. um, and it, it, it came to fruition. So mm -hmm. a cool feeling for sure, man, for sure, man. Um, so let's call it maybe five, 10 min minutes more. Um, okay. everyone, like, yeah. I bring on, I ask a specific question to, um, okay. kind of kicking it back to music for a second. Yeah, who's your, maybe who's your favorite artist and or favorite song of all time? Ooh, that is, you know, that's a tough one. And, and that, that answer has changed over time. Um, but I would say consistently over the past five years, 
my favorite song has been a song called Passenger by a band called Deftones. Um, and to me, that song like combines, I've, I've really actually got like heavier music, partially due to my friend Chris Woldeman. Um, and, you know, it combines my, my love for heavy music and um, it's a very catchy melody. Um, uh, yeah, I love that song, so. Yeah, is there something about it that you can, you know, connect to your life that makes it that, that special to you or is it more just the, the heavy nature of it? What is it about that song? Um, I mean, I certainly think of, I, I certainly think of moments when I've been chilling with Chris and we're listening to that song and both vibing off of it. It's, it's when you, when you find somebody that you can, you know, listen to music with, um, and, and both vibe off the same song. That's, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, you know, I think about the song is all about like driving with the windows down. Um, and it's got this just very eerie kind of, kind of feeling behind it. And it's, it kind of puts puts you in a mood. I don't know. It's hard to describe. It, that's the thing though. It, it, it absolutely mm -hmm. is hard to describe because that's mm -hmm. music is transcendental. And mm -hmm. especially when you're in a communion with, with, with a best friend or even someone that you don't know very well, I think in a way like our generation concerts or, you know, big music festivals, that's kind of like our church. <laughs> oh yeah. I, yeah, completely. I mean, one thing like, you, you know, a good song when even, even if it's the hundredth, not maybe not, yeah the hundredth time you're listening to it it still sends chills down your arm right like it still it still affects you in a way that um mm -hmm. that it did like even the first time you heard it so. yeah there's a couple i feel like we're kind of getting a revival of some of the 70s and 80s music i mm -hmm. like edm a lot and there's a uh, a song called gimme gimme by uh, abba it's called a man after midnight yeah, and that's on music festival last last week there's three or four different djs the kind of music that most people would just be like, oh, that, that, what is that shit? But they mm -hmm. all played some rendition of that specific ABBA song. And then another one that's that's back now is, it's called um, uh, Running Up That Hill. And it's an 80s song by, I think it's Kate something. Oh, um, I know exactly what song you're talking about. Yes. And throughout the years, there's been cover after cover of this song. But when he said about the ones that have been played a hundred times, right? Like if you think about, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily put Don't Stop Believing in the category of great song, right? But yeah. in that same vein, whether it's like Toto Africa or Michael Jackson mm -hmm. beat it, like no matter when it is or what it is, any generation, <laughs> when you yeah. hear the first couple notes of beat it, how do you not like sh shake oh. your head or start like, kind of like drumming to the beat? Oh, for sure. So I'll return that question back to you. So what is the, what is your number one song, number one artist right now? Or I think it, if, if you said that that, that doesn't change, I, I would actually call BS. I think for everyone, it should change because you go through different mm -hmm. parts of life. I mean, mm -hmm. there's one of the top three artists, like Cascade, uh, you know, Kanye West, and uh, Dead Mouse. Like, that was me yeah. when I was, like, 21, right? But yeah. I, between my, my 20s, each of those artists had a specific song that I was loving, 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 you know? Um, mm -hmm. You know, best song, my favorite song. It probably is almost never the what people would call the best song, but it's because they have connection, right? Um, mm -hmm. There are certain ones to me that are just like church, man, like amazing, amazing music. Um, they're you know, Dead Mouse Strobe at one point. Strobe. It sounded like outer space. <laughs> you know what oh, I that's mean? That's cool. And you're oh, yeah. able, I mean, the older I get, the more I, I like to spend time with myself and just like in my own thoughts. Um, it's funny. I haven't really thought about that question, man, but that that's one. Mm -hmm. but, you know, today I was listening to Kanye West. I think his his best album is Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. And I would say on that album, The Pinnacles is probably Runaway with the, yeah, okay. the, the final 30 seconds of that song. He was experimenting with, with auto-tune at that time. Mm -hmm. And if you if anyone that knows that song, he's almost like humming but also like moaning and he's not really even saying words it goes back and forth between being audible and not audible mm -hmm. and it's so goddamn emotional man like because he's talking about a relationship and you mm -hmm. can feel his emotion through that that 20 or 30 seconds of, of that so i wouldn't say runaway is my favorite kanye west song of all time but that that comes up um yeah that's cool 
there are certain artists that to me are are just brilliant and i put kanye yeah. kanye up there for sure but yeah i think i mean you just bring something to mind it's like you know i've lived in chicago now for a year um so i'm like starting or oak park i should more specifically um and so i'm like i feel like i'm just now starting to kind of find my my place um and so that means i'm you know i'm meeting my neighbors um and i've i've connected with one of my from you know we we get together on our porch on our porches and listen to music um and i think that's such a great connection to have with people um just to be able to sit down and listen and swap songs and you know anyway. yeah out of all the people i know you're that's like your thing i think yeah i love doing it so yeah you love sitting at the 405 on the couches oh yeah maybe have a little little bowl of something you know exactly and, yeah put on <laughs> for sure music and, uh, you know same with chris Wildeman, like nothing like his yeah. couch and yeah you know, listening <laughs> to music. um but yeah i was gonna say as we kind of wrap up here carla mm -hmm. is from warrenville naperville like my, my girlfriend we'd love yeah. to do like a double date or something there in oak park and i'd love to yeah, yeah. There, there's a good chance i'll i'll maybe at some point be in the western burbs myself as a, as mm -hmm. a resident so oh nice um, would love to get to know oak, oak park a little better or yeah. wherever you guys are at you know i'm happy to come out to are you uh, looking at houses out here or? i, I want to be in this house that i bought maybe three years ago for another okay. three or four years i think so yeah. we still have, hopefully you're still in the city but i do mm -hmm. spend more and more time out in the western burbs since her family's out there okay and, uh, i'm partial to oak park because i i want to be closer to the where things are happening in the city yeah no for sure as opposed to uh montgomery or the middle of nowhere right but yeah um you know it'd be cool to to get to know you and Taylor a little better. Well, yeah, we'll be, I mean, again, she's in her second year of residency. Um, so we'll be here at least another couple of years, three years. So. Um, sure. Well, yeah. looking forward to it, man. And uh, just wanted to say thanks again for hopping on. And this was absolutely, a, it was a really good conversation because, you know, I, I'm a little tired personally, right? Myself right <laughs> now, but like, there's a certain level of connection I feel with you and um, you're someone that I continue to, be excited to have my life so thanks for coming on buddy. yeah i i really appreciate you inviting me to this so i've had fun yeah at first podcast check yeah. <laughs> out the way it's in the yeah. books yeah man i'd love to do it more so i hope you continue doing this and i look forward to seeing your other guests so sounds good man talk to you later right. have a good night yeah take it easy